Good morning, Lord Provost, ladies and gentlemen. I think I have about six minutes. Okay yeah, we do things ahead of schedule, yeah. so that's fine. Um, I, I know that I'm all that stands between all of you and a cup of coffee and looking around the auditorium. I think I'm not the only one that needs a, a caffeine injection, so I will be mercifully brief if I can be. Uh, what I'd like to do is just give a quick, and it will be very quick, introduction to Dong Energy. Many of you know us as a wind developer, but I thought it might be useful to just give a little bit of an overview um, of the business as a whole before diving into what we're up to in offshore wind. And what I'd like to do is to give you a perspective of the offshore wind uh, future for the UK from the perspective of, of, uh, of a developer and uh, I suppose one of the larger developers in the sector. So very quickly, uh, our, industry, our, our business is made up of four segments, uh, thermal power, customers and markets, which is kind of selling electricity, EMP, uh, which definitely deserves a mention whilst we're in Aberdeen, and of course wind power. We're about 6,300 employees. Um, we are owned, as you probably know, by the Danish state, which brings some interesting challenges and opportunities uh, compared to some of our peers. Very quickly knocking off the first two, thermal business, uh, we have around six, just over six gigawatts of generating capacity around our northern European markets, mostly in the, uh, in the Danish market, but also elsewhere. Um, interesting fact there is that uh, at the moment we are co-firing with biomass around 20%. We are aiming to take that up to 50% um, of our Danish power stations by 2020. So a big challenge there to bring in the, uh, the scale of biomass co-firing uh, that we, we strive to achieve. Moving on to customers and markets very quickly. Uh, we have around 1.2 million uh, customers, residential and commercial customers in Denmark. We're the biggest utility, uh, biggest power supplier in Denmark. Uh, we also have now integrated our rather struggling energy markets business into, um, into that business segment. Some of you may know if you saw our results uh, announced in February that we had a rather difficult time last year and although we had revenues of around 7.7 .7 billion pounds we actually made a loss of about half a billion pounds which largely comes down to some challenging conditions for the uh, energy market division which as I say has now been uh, merged into customers and markets. Homing in a little bit on EMP and wind power which I guess is uh, the Aberdeen piece of the story if you like. EMP first, we're currently producing about 80,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day. Uh, that's from Norway and Denmark. We'll be bringing production on in, in the UK as well as other markets over the remainder of this decade, getting up to around 150,000 barrels a day and challengingly keeping our reserve production ratio above 10, which those of you who've worked in the EMP world will recognize that doubling your production and growing your reserves base is a pretty tall order, but that's the plan and we have the, uh, the acreage to do it. And then finally, our wind business. We have around 1.7 gigawatts of installed wind capacity spread across the UK, Denmark. We do have some onshore uh, wind as well, but that is uh, exiting our portfolio, as most of you will know. Uh, the overall business mix, co-firing of thermal uh, and also wind, is driving our strategic target of cutting the CO2 intensity of our electricity that we sell to our customers cutting it down from 650 grams a kilowatt hour in 20, uh, 2006 down to around 260 by 2020. That is a big challenge of, and of course wind power will play a major role in that. But uh, as we've heard, this is all about business. It's not just about carbon. Uh, and we will also be driving up our return on capital employed above 12%, which makes us an attractive investment, I hope, because we are also out looking for um, uh, funders to come into our business uh, at the group level, uh, as you may also know, which is a big change for us as a state-owned company. A little bit about what we do in the UK. We have grown quite a lot in the UK. In 2005, Dong Energy in the UK had five employees. We now have 500. So we have grown tremendously, and a lot of that is in wind power, actually. Uh, we're over, getting on for 300 in wind power now. But just going through the different markets that we serve, uh, you'll see a little green blob down at the bottom of the London office. That's uh, where we drive our uh, B2B gas sales business that we bought from Shell last year. It's about the fifth largest uh, B2B gas sales business in the UK, around 7,000 customers and just over 10% of the market. Uh, it's a challenging market to work in, but uh, we seem to be uh, surviving and more. Power generation, we have one thermal power station down in Severn, uh, down in South Wales. 
It's one of the world's most efficient uh, gas power plants. And when it's operating, which it now finally is, it's taken a while to get it going, uh, it's producing uh, over 800 megawatts. So a small but important part of the uh, thermal generation mix in the UK. In terms of EMP in the UK, uh, we are the largest license holder west of Shetlands. We're a partner with Total in the Lag and Tormor development, which comes on, online uh, next year. Uh, we'll be producing into the Shetland Islands and is a very important part of Dong Energy's portfolio, but also for UK PLC, a very important uh, future development, future revenue stream uh, for HMRC. We also have nine other discoveries in West of Shetlands that we're working on developing and bringing on stream uh, in the future years. And of course, that will contribute to the 150,000 barrels a day of production that we're aiming for. And finally, wind. Uh, wind, we have uh, around 1.4 gigawatts of capacity that we've built in the UK. Uh, we have divested quite a lot of that, and I'll come back to that. And we have uh, around 900 megawatts under construction and a pipeline that's upwards of five gigawatts. So we have a lot of activity in the UK and it's, it's a very important market for uh, our wind business. A few numbers, just looking at where we are going. Um, overall, we have around 1.7 gigawatts of wind in our portfolio, which is around one third of the installed capacity across all markets. We expect by 2020 to have built six and a half gigawatts of offshore wind predominantly in the UK and Germany, but as you know, we're also operating in France, and of course we have future developments coming up in Denmark as well. Uh, other markets may open up, uh, and we, we will wait and, and watch that. In the context of growing the business roughly fourfold, we will also be uh, looking to drive the cost of energy down significantly for offshore wind, down to 100 euros a megawatt hour for projects being sanctioned in 2020, and that is a big big challenge and I'll come back in a moment to how we expect to deliver that. If you look at that by market, you can see that the UK is by, by far the largest market that we are going to be operating in uh, over the remainder of this decade. You can see we're talking about 10 and a half gigawatts of installed capacity by 2020. That is uh, a dong view. It is one of a number of views and uh, be interested to perhaps discuss that later with uh, anyone who would like to understand where that comes from. But as you can see, we intend to grow our markets, not just in the UK, also in Germany and in France um, and in Denmark, of course. How do we do that? Well, I'll come back to how we're actually building it. A very important point is around financial investors. Uh, and we've heard a little bit about that uh, earlier. Just to say, we are bringing in more and more financial investors. Indeed, bringing them in not only after construction, but during construction as well, which we've achieved uh, particularly in Walney, where we've brought in OPW, a Dutch uh, combination of an equity and pension fund, who've come into the Walney offshore wind development um, whilst we've been constructing it, which is a major step for us in terms of uh, figuring out how to bring capital in before we finish building them. I think everyone knows the energy trilemma. I don't know who came up with that word, but uh, it's a lovely one, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, keeping the lights on driving carbon out of our um, economy, and of course keeping uh, the costs manageable. And we hear a lot about the government's trilemma for energy policy, but I thought a developer should have a trilemma as well, so we've got one of our own. Yeah. So here's the Dong Energy view of a developer's trilemma, uh, which frankly is not that different. It comes down to uh, policy, policy certainty, cost of energy, and uh, creating jobs and economic benefit for the UK. So I thought I'd just talk very, very briefly, Maria, about each of those, if I may. If you're quick. Firstly, cost of energy. We know that we need to bring offshore wind costs down to, so that they are in line with other forms of power generation, and we need to do it quickly uh, to minimise the impact on consumer bills and, of course, to attract investors uh, and enable the industry to develop at the scale that we would like to see. Uh, clearly, offshore wind is competing with a number of other traditional and uh, emerging technologies, and we need to make sure that offshore wind is a, is a winner in that competition. The 100 euros a megawatt hour represents a cost reduction of around 40%, from where, 30 to 40% from where we are today. And that is a target that we have set for a typical round three project. So it is in deeper water, but admittedly with uh, particularly uh, good offshore wind resource. 
What does it take to do that? Well, it takes radical innovation with suppliers and continuous improvement in our own business. Uh, I'll just touch very briefly upon the areas that we're focusing on. And we've, we've set up our own cost of energy team reporting directly to the CEO to focus on this. It's a big strategic uh, plank of our future business and one that we will deliver on. Firstly, turbines. Uh, as you know, we've got the first two offshore six megawatt Siemens turbines, direct drive turbines now up and uh, being commissioned at Gunfleet Sands. That's a, a major step for us. Uh, on top of that, we are working with Siemens and with a number of other turbine manufacturers looking at the next generation because we can see 6 megawatts is a, is a good step from 3.6 for us and as you know we've, we do a lot with Siemens at the moment but we recognize that if we're going to hit 100 euros a megawatt hour we have to get bigger we have to get higher capacity turbines 8 to 10 megawatts and we have to grow the rotors as well uh, from the 154 that we see on the 6 megawatt machine upwards to 200 meters and possibly beyond. That is a big challenge, but it's one that we will need to meet if we're going to drive the cost of energy down as far as we, we would like to. Second area, transmission. There is a lot of work going on. As you know, we're in a couple of round three projects, including Hornsey, which is quite a long way from shore. We're looking very hard at whether DC is going to be a good solution for that. Uh, if it is, how do we implement it? How do we make that a cost-effective piece of the puzzle. And I think transmission as we get to larger, further from shore developments is going to become a bigger and bigger piece of the innovation challenge. Thirdly, installation vessels. Uh, we've already started using the next generation vessels. Uh, we've just started constructing west of Dudden Sands uh, earlier this week, actually yesterday, the first vessel sailed out from Belfast Harbour. They are uh, larger, more capable vessels. And I think the development of vessel technology and capability will be critical to enable us to build wind farms uh, more cost effectively and uh, with less risk from weather. O&M, we've already talked, uh, we've heard about O&M from Hoob. We know that O&M is going to be a big opportunity for the UK, uh, but we do need to look at how we can drive costs out of O&M. Clearly turbine technology improving will be one area, but also large field O&M strategies is a, a very interesting area. We, we've sort of developed the industry around operating wind farms with 15, 20, 30, 40 turbines. When we move to hundreds of turbines, many hundreds of turbines, we have to take a different look, and I'm sure we can take a leaf out of the book of the likes of uh, DHL uh, and others who are very good at logistics, because there are some big challenges that we need to face, uh, face up to and find ways of, of operating wind farms in a completely different way to how we do it today. So developers like Dong and others, we, we need to push technology innovation, we need to push, push risk mitigation. But also, we need government and ourselves to work together to deliver a more competitive supply chain, which we very much hope will include a very effective and successful supply chain in the UK. And that's because we know that we want to be a responsible developer. We know that we, we need to contribute to the markets where we operate. Uh, and we need to bring value to the economy in return for the, the support that we receive from consumers. Just a few facts, we've, we've been looking at what we've achieved so far. For example, west of Dudden Sands, we expect uh, a UK content of around 30 plus percent. Uh, something like uh, 15,000 job years coming out of west of Dudden Sands and Walney over their life cycle. That's equivalent to 500 jobs over 24 years. So not an insignificant contribution. And of course, the O&M piece of that is extremely important. We're also investing in infrastructure. You'll know we have the Belfast Harbour facility. That's a 50 million pound investment that we've signed up for with Belfast Harbour commissioners. It's now going live with the West of Dudden Sands construction. So we're very keen to see the UK supply chain develop and we're, we're working with all the various bodies that are looking at this, the Offshore Wind Industry Council, the Offshore Wind Programme Board. We're also having bilateral discussions with beers and with others. But we need to understand how do we balance cost reduction and UK supply chain? There's no doubt that having an effective UK supply chain will be great for the industry, but in the process of getting there, we of course face challenges, challenges around new entrants, around reliability, around performance, around cost, around schedule. And we have to understand, and we need to know very clearly from government, how do we balance those two priorities? Because they do compete. Ultimately, the two will be aligned, but on the process of getting there, there are some some distinct tensions that we need to understand and manage. And the other piece that will drive the UK supply chain is knowing that there's going to be a market, and I'll come on to that right now. So 
policy certainty. We've heard a little bit about it, but I think it's probably one of the biggest challenges that we as a developer are facing. And, and as, of course, we're a developer that has alternatives in other markets. We're in Germany, we're in France, we're in Denmark, potentially other markets. And we need to know that the UK market is going to be one that will deliver. So we have policy certainty in the short term, EMR and the energy bill. We've heard about the uh, EMR being definitely finished, completed. Uh, I look forward to that. I think one word on that is that we need to be careful that perfect doesn't become the enemy of just about good enough to let us get on with our business. Um, there is always opportunity to tinker and fiddle and challenge, but at some point we have to say this is good enough, let's get on with it and enable developers like us to know what the lie of the land is and get on and start investing. And we do know that the current hiatus is undoubtedly creating uncertainty in the eyes of investors. We very much welcome the CFD. We think once we have a CFD for a project, it definitely reduces uncertainty, creates a, a good investment opportunity for financial investors. But there's a lot of detail to work out still. Um, and we hope that we and other developers can work closely with DEC over the coming months, not many months actually, to get this button down uh, so that we all know where we stand by the end of the year. But looking beyond the energy bill, we really also need to know what's happening beyond the end of this decade. I'm sure many of you work in the uh, supply chain and you will understand the need for market certainty and that came out very clearly at the first meeting of the Offshore Wind Industry Council last week. We know what we uh, are dealing with up to the end of this decade but that isn't enough to give investors in the supply chain the certainty they need and we talk of course a lot to the UK supply chain as well as uh, the incumbents from Denmark, Germany and elsewhere and we know for sure that this is a critical element, whether it's through the levy control framework or whether it's through decarbonisation targets, whatever it is, we need to understand and the supply chain needs to understand that they can be confident of a market beyond 2020. And I think that is very much in the gift of government. It's not something that developers or indeed the supply chain themselves can deliver. So that was slightly more than seven minutes, but a quick perspective from the developer's view. But all I would say is, you know, when we developers, supply chain, governments, and all the rest of us get it right, then we can do great things. Um, we've heard about London Array coming on stream. We're building west of Dudden Sands. We're kicking off westernmost rough, and we have a strong pipeline for the future as well. So here's hoping we can get this right and uh, Dong Energy continue to uh, build out into the UK waters. Thank you. Bench, thank you so much.